Hi folks and welcome to the Meaningful Money Podcast, Season 14, Episode 10. This is the podcast dedicated to helping you put your finances in order. My name is Pete Matthew and I'm going to share with you everything you need to know and everything you need to do to secure your financial future. I'm here to help you make sense of money. Here we are, once again, rounding off the season. Time, time to sort of tie things off here. It's the now traditional season-ending Q&A. You've been sending in your questions throughout the season. I've done my best to sort of collate them, uh, almost curate them, really, because there's been so many, to the main points. Needless to say, I'm not going to get to all of them, unfortunately, but very shortly I'll be answering the ones that I've selected. So... After that, I'll uh, read out a review that's been left and talk about what's going to be happening in the intervening few weeks before Season 15 kicks off. Before all that, though, remember, this podcast continues to be brought to you with the help of my friends at Seven Investment Management. They've been helping me out here since the spring of 2011. Really, genuinely could not have done this without them. So please do check out what they're up to and say thank you. They're at 7im.co.uk. That's the number 7im.co.uk. Go check them out. Okay, let's not hang around because we've got a bit of ground to cover. Let's get straight into the questions. Remember, notes, links, all that good stuff there at the show notes as they always are. And it's the only link you need to remember. Meaningfulmoney.tv slash NA10. That's for new accumulators, episode 10. Meaningfulmoney.tv slash NA10. Let's crack on. This is the first of the questions. Okay, now, despite having dealt with this in some depth, uh, the... What's now become an age-old question of help to buy versus lifetime ISA uh, has come up a few times. One of the people asked that was Scott, and he says, I currently have a help to buy ISA. I've been putting away the full amount for nearly three years. However, I'm probably about two years away from being able to afford mortgage repayments. Is it worth starting a lifetime ISA? And is it possible to transfer the savings from a help to buy ISA? Well, I answered, or at least I attempted to uh, answer the help to buy versus lifetime ISA question at the end of season 13. But, you know, I had enough questions about this. I thought I'd just try and give you the very quick version here before we move on, okay? I believe lifetime ISAs are better than help to buy ISAs for the following reasons. Help to buy ISAs are cash only. There's no stocks and shares option, right? So you've got less, much lower potential for long-term growth. Help to buy ISAs have a lower subscription limit. Uh, It's basically 200 quid a month plus an initial subscription of 1,200 pounds. You can only save a maximum of 12,000 pounds into the help to buy ISA. You never see the bonus with a help to buy ISA. It gets added on completion of the house purchase and it gets kind of requested by the solicitor who is acting for you. Whereas with the lifetime ISA, it gets added as you go along. So you get the growth on that bonus as well. Of course, it can be taken away if you decide to use your lifetime ISA money for something other than first-time house purchase or retirement past age 60. Lastly, you can, apparently, I heard conflicting stuff on this. This is not really a, a sphere that I operate in very much, but apparently you can transfer your help, help to buy ISA into a lifetime ISA and get the bonus now. Check the rules on both, right? Carry out and tour. <laughs> Make sure you know what you're doing. Because I actually found some deeply conflicting stuff on this. But I will link in the show notes back to the season 13 QA where I got a little bit deeper into it. But uh, that's just a sort of rapid fire, quick version help to buy versus lifetime ISA. Right. Second question What to do with a windfall? This is uh, Ian in the Facebook group asking this question. You are in the Facebook group, aren't you? If not, meaningfulmoney.tv slash community for simply the coolest place on the social interwebs. Um, What to do with a windfall? Windfalls can be as much of a headache as a blessing for sure. Depending on the source of the windfall, they can carry some pretty powerful emotions with them too. If you think about it, often a windfall is the result of a bereavement, redundancy, maybe a generous gift. And it can be hard to separate the emotion from the practicalities of managing that money when it comes. But we've got to try and set those emotions aside. I've had experience with clients who inherited shares from a loved one and then they retained those shares for sentimental reasons. Makes absolutely no sense to do so in the cold light of day, but emotions, sentiment are powerful things. The first thing to do 
when a windfall comes is nothing. There is no rush to do anything at all. It's far better to wait and do things right than do them quick. All right, so my wife tells me. Now, my belief is that a windfall really should simply accelerate what you would ordinarily do with your money. So if you've got bad debt, clear it down. If doing so would likely take all of the windfall, then I think there's an argument for doing something with the money which kind of marks the occasion somehow, if it's a, a positive uh, reason why you've come into the money. So if it came from an inheritance and you can't bear to just see it all go against your credit card debt, then maybe buy a little something to remember the donor by, right? But don't blow it all on an Audi to remember them by, right? <laughs> something small and poignant perhaps. Uh, by marking the event in some way, but doing the right thing with the rest, you're still obviously much better off than you would otherwise have been. Just don't go, get back into debt then, and in so doing, effectively, you've wasted the money that you've received in the windfall. Use the windfall to start or complete your emergency fund if you haven't done that yet, then look to invest some of it, but not before, right? All that's happening with the windfall usually is you're kind of getting a push along the board. It's like climbing a ladder in a snakes and ladders game. You know, you jump forward several squares, maybe even a row or two on the board if it's a really big ladder, but the journey and the end result is the same. Obviously, have a mind to things like tax. If you are any doubt about the tax implications of receiving the money, then seek professional advice on that. Most windfalls from things like lottery or pools or gambling wins are tax-free. Inheritances will usually come to you tax paid. But if there is any doubt, if you've got complications like trusts and stuff, take advice, right? So that's my basic answer, right? I'm sure some of the people asking this question were like, well, you know, what's the investment strategy when you, when you get a, a windfall of some kind? But really, it's just an acceleration of what you would be doing anyway. And it's really important, I think, to remember that. Not get hung up on the fact that it's perhaps a lot of money in a short time. Just do what you would have done had you come into that money on the drip over several months or years. Right? It's just, you know, uh, an acceleration. Maybe there's a standalone episode uh, in this, and certainly there's, you know, a lot of detail potentially behind it, but that's essentially my basic answer. Carry on doing what you were doing anyway to put yourself on a firm financial footing. It's just accelerated, which is cool. Now, Ben asked an absolutely brilliant question. It's been on my mind anyway, uh, but it really brought it to the fore when he asked it. Um, I've attempted to knuckle down and actually answer it. I'm not 100% convinced that I have. Essentially, in his question, Ben, uh, he gets that equities are where the growth is, right? But when using bonds as a diversifier in a portfolio and a volatility reducer, he's having much more difficulty finding a bond fund than an equity fund. Sound familiar? Yes. Now, part of the problem is that, that bonds are such a very broad church. They go from junk bonds issued by tiny companies to UK gilts and US treasuries. Now, if you're not really planning to make money with this money, but it's purely a diversifier, then really your main goal is to prevent a loss, right? Now, right now, sovereign debt in developed markets, so UK gilts, US treasuries, that sort of thing, they are at record low yields. We're talking 400 year low yields, right? That's quite historic. Yields are the inverse of prices, essentially. So where yields go down, prices go up. And so if we're in record low yields, we're at record high prices. Now, that doesn't mean that prices will definitely go down from here, but it's arguably more likely than not. Now, back in episode 317 with the legend that is Lars Croyer, he essentially suggested buying a global tracker fund and then if you wanted to diversify and to sort of limit volatility a little bit, buy government bonds in your local jurisdiction, which for most of us listening here in the UK, that means buying gilts. Now you can buy gilts directly from the debt management office. There's a link in the notes. Um, you're not buying a fund, you're actually buying the gilt. You will get the piece of paper, or probably the electronic version of it now. Um, you, you know, you, there's no real time here, I don't think, to go into pros and cons of this, but no doubt for most of us, a fund is an easier way of doing it, right? Now, where do you look for funds? One of the great starting points is to look at the sectors. And the UK gilt sector has 30-odd funds in it, I think. Um, you're going to need to dig, though. So I did a very, very quick filter 
on that sector, I used Morningstar, the free tools there, to find first quartile funds in the UK gilt sector over one, three, and five years, right? That whittled things down to six funds, not too much between them in terms of five years' performance. But when I brought in, just out of interest, Vanguard Life Strategy 60, 60% equity fund, and just compared the volatility of that, which has 60% in shares and the rest in bonds, when I brought that in, I compared the volatility of it with all those gilt funds, the life strategy fund was actually less volatile than the guilt funds, right? So in your question, Ben, you pointed out that the reason for this is that most guilt tracker funds, they track the whole guilt market, and hence they tend towards longer dated guilts. Guilts, remember, are IOUs. So longer dated guilts means that you, the IOU, you get your money back, it's longer down the line. And they are more volatile than shorter dated guilts. Essentially, the shorter the date, the nearer the time to redemption. And so prices are much less volatile at the short end of the scale. So you, you're going to really need to dig deep into the data. You, you, know, you can find short dated guilt funds. They will hardly move at all, right? So they're not going to make you any money. They are there purely to balance and to provide a volatility, volatility reducer for a portfolio as a whole. Uh, it's going to take a bit of work for you to find. This is, I think, such an unprecedented time in the history of guilt prices. I'm not sure there is an answer to it right now, but short-dated guilt funds are likely to be the least volatile option, should offer something near the capital preservation, which is kind of the whole point of the exercise. Perhaps I need to get Lars Croyer on again. <laughs> Lars, just answer this question for us. Um, so, Ben, I'm not convinced I've answered that question to your or my satisfaction there, but in order to do what Lars was suggesting the guilt element of a portfolio should do, which is to temper the volatility of the whole thing. You are looking at short dated guilts. You're not going to make any money. You're probably going to lose money in real terms, but it'll do its volatility reducing job, uh, perhaps unsatisfactorily. <laughs> okay. Um, a few people asked about whether or not it makes sense to pay more into a pension than you will get on your employer match, all right? So most of us, if we are employees, if we join the workplace pension, employer puts some in, we put some in, and some employers will match whatever you put in up to a certain point. They have to put a minimum amount in for you, um, but some will go further than that. So if you decide you wanna put 10% in, some will match 10%, all right? Some will match 7%. The question is, if let's say your employer matches 8%, but you're paying in 10%, does that make it worthwhile? That extra 2%, is it really worthwhile? Now, regular listeners know that whenever I get the ISA versus pension question, my basic answer is that you should, obviously, if you're employed, get as much into your pension to maximize that free match from your employer. Everything else can go into ISAs, particularly when you're starting out. Darren and Chris, though, asked this particular question about paying in more. So Chris mentioned that his plan was for the ISA to bridge the gap between his desired semi-retirement age of 55 and then between that and when he anticipated taking benefits from his pensions at 58. So he had like a three or four year window there and he was paying into his ISAs to bridge that gap. Now in that comment, I think Chris answered his own question, not to put too fine a point on it, but if you're in the position to contribute more than your employer's match into your pension, then planning is likely to be a bigger factor for you than if you're just starting out. Chris says he's 33 in his comment in the Facebook group, so he's really planning 25 years ahead, which is brilliant. So here's a little sneak peek at what we're going to be talking about in season 15. It's going to begin in September. Um, the title of the season will be Planning with Purpose. All right? I'm going to be building on the new accumulator season, looking at what you need to know, what you need to do when you're well down the road of the wealth building journey. So it's going to be some of these little nuances and the planning points. For most of us, though, the answer to whether we should divert extra pension contributions, extra and in inverted commas, will depend on our own individual plans. If you take away the individual life planning that we're doing, the maths will always favor pensions simply because of the tax relief on the way in. You've got more money to compound as a result. The fund will be larger than the equivalent ISA fund at any given point, assuming identical charges and investment profile. The free money grows quicker, right? So you'll end up with a bigger fund. 
obvious, really. <clears throat> now, ICEs are tax-free. Pensions are taxed. Pensions are incredibly flexible, though, uh, at least under current rules. And, <clears throat> excuse me, you can draw a ton of money tax-free from a pension, particularly if you've got no other income at the time. Maybe before your state or other pensions, like final salary pensions, kick in. So Chris is talking about bridging the gap from 55 to 58. Well, if he has no other income in that period, he's got a personal allowance every year, right? So he could, in that year, under current figures and current rules, you know, with a personal allowance at 12,500 currently, you could draw 16,666 from a DC pension fund without paying any tax at all. With one quarter of that is tax-free cash anyway, and the other three quarters falls entirely into your personal allowance, assuming you had no other income. So if your plans suggest, because of your timeline and how you're thinking things might pan out, if that suggests that you'd like a larger ISA fund, then get your employer match into your pension and redirect everything else into ISAs. But in the absence of a clear plan like that, favor pensions is my answer to the question. Great question. A few people ask this. <laughs> Number five, what should I do when the next recession hits? Mm. <laughs> Short answer, nothing. Or better still, find some more money and invest it while markets are down. Let's define a recession. Essentially, the technical definition of recession is two consecutive quarters, three-month periods, where the economy has reduced in size. Right? Recessions are normal. Right? They come around as part of the economic cycle, which just seems to repeat itself. Sometimes the cycle is longer in duration, in wavelength, if you like. Sometimes it is shorter. We're in a very long uh, growth period. We haven't had a recession for 10 years now. But they are normal. They can be painful, but recessions are usually fairly short-lived. They usually almost always mean a drop in markets, right? That is also normal. And regular listeners know that actually a falling market represents shares being on sale, all right? And so you can now buy them cheaper than you used to be able to. Now, what you must never do is to think that you can go into cash. I'm going to sell all my investments, keep my money in cash. I will ride out the recession and then I will reinvest because I'm ever so clever and my timing is immaculate. Now, if you could do that, then so could I, we all could do that, and none of us would ever lose a penny. But you will, and so would I, get the timing wrong and do serious, serious damage to your wealth building if you try and time in and out of markets. Many of you will have seen uh, charts that show the impact of missing the 20 best days in the stock markets over the last 20 years, roughly 5,000 trading days. You know, if you miss the 20 best days and it has a big impact on your growth, there's loads of different studies on that and it's a quite a compelling sort of picture. The message is very clear. Stay in the market, all right? Don't try to time it. It is absolutely a fool's errand. Instead, you must stay invested. Even if your gut is telling you you want to bail out, if you've got the spine to stay in, your future self will thank you. Interesting little note that... When markets decline, you know, sometimes the very worst days, if you can imagine the counter argument to missing the, ten, the 20 best days is that, well, actually, if you miss the 20 worst days, that's going to be pretty good, right? Um, what we sometimes fail to understand is that sometimes the worst days are followed very quickly by the best days. If you look back in history, you look back to the Great Recession of the uh, sort of late 20s, early 30s, um, back to 2008, nine, the credit crisis, some of the worst stock market days, massive declines, you know, many percent, um, very often were followed just a few days later by significant increases. And what you don't want to do is to bail out and miss those increases because it really does all pan out in the end. You must stay invested. So don't panic. Ignore the news. Don't invest money you're going to need in the next three years or so. It's very, very, very rare for a recession to last that long. Spread your money around using multi-asset funds or a collection of trackers, which are tracking different asset classes and geographical markets. You know the drill by now. But if you invest like that, you've got nothing to fear from recessions. For what it's worth, I don't believe we're heading for a recession in the next 12 to 18 months. I'm not an economist, but I read a lot of stuff on this. Growth is slowing a bit. Right? The world economy is still growing, though. Right? I think there's enough reasons to be cheerful still right now. 
Certainly no need to be afeared, as they say in Poldark. I reckon, despite the efforts, the efforts of our politicians to screw it all up for us, it's not in a bad place, slowing, but not declining. I nearly put my fist through my TV screen the other day, listening to the BBC, on which somebody actually said the economy has shrunk, which was blatantly untrue. I don't think it was a lie. I think it was a mistake. But the economy shrinking is very different from growth slowing. It just means the economy is growing, but more slowly than it was. And that's okay, right? It's very different to its shrinking. So we've got to be careful with our language. We've got to be careful what we listen to. Um, but don't do anything to try and beat a recession. You will miss out as a result. Number six, I've got seven in total. How do I choose which pension fund to invest in? A few of you have asked the question about choosing the right fund for a pension, particularly in the context of workplace pensions. The questions that I've got have um, been bemoaning the fact that while you'd like to invest in the sort of passive multi-asset fund that I'm always banging on about here, such a thing isn't available in your workplace pension. Chances are, though, that there is something near it. So we're just going to need to do a bit of homework. So the first step is to approach your pension provider, uh, usually an insurance company through uh, a workplace, or it'll be somebody, somebody like Nest or the People's Pension, and get a list of all available investment options. Right, for your particular scheme. There will be a phone number on your most recent statement. It may be that you have a portal that you can log into, but get a full list of possible investment options. It's the first thing I would do as an advisor here when I'm looking at somebody's pensions is not to look and ch at changing the pension provider, but to see what changes can be made with the existing provider. A lot cheaper, a lot less hassle in the long run. So get a list of funds from your scheme. Might be a web page with that information, but... Hopefully that list will show you which sector each of the available funds are in. Sectors are collections of funds. Uh, there's a few different providers of sectors, but the, the most common ones is the investment association sectors, the IA sectors. And they're a collection of funds which are invested in broadly the same way. So collections of peer funds, if you like. The idea, of course, is that it enables you to compare a fund with its peers. Look for the mixed asset sectors, of which there are three. 0 to 35% shares, 20 to 60% shares, and 40 to 85% shares. And then finally, we have the flexible investment sector. All right. Now, if there is really no fund that you can access in your pension that falls into one of those, then look for funds with risk profile type names, things like the balanced fund or cautious or conservative, adventurous, defensive you get a sense of what they're after and what they're trying to achieve. Take a look inside them and you'll likely find that there is a blend of asset classes there. All right? I genuinely wouldn't lose sleep over this. Pick one, pick one or two funds, crack on, keep it under review, make a point of checking in once a year maybe to see if new funds have been made available on the pension scheme. Make sure you review your chosen fund or funds maybe once a year, something like that. But... It isn't going to make or break you. You don't want to, I suppose the thing that might make or break you is what you don't want to do is have pension money in too cautious a fund. So uh, given the time scale, probably for many of you listening to this, given the time scale before you're likely to even be able to access that money, chances are you should take more risk than you're thinking about doing. Okay. Last question. Quite a few people ask this. Is my platform money safe? Now, I did a couple of videos, a couple of five minute Fridays on this a while ago now. Um, a frequent question I get, I get it all the time is that is the protected status of investments on platforms. And you can see where the confusion lies. You know, if I hold assets, like the smallest unit of investing, like a share or a bond, if I hold that inside a fund, and then I hold that fund and probably some more funds on a platform, where the hell actually is my money actually? Right? What happens if some level of that pyramid asset, fund, platform, what happens if some level of that goes under? How much protection do I actually have? Now, here in the UK, we have a scheme called the Financial Services Compensation Scheme. It's government-backed, designed to make sure that investors are protected against a company not being able to honor its liabilities to you. Now, the headline figure you need to know is £85,000. You are protected for up to £85,000 per person per provider if an investment company goes bust with your money 
All right. Used to be 85 grand for savings and 50,000 pounds for investments. Now it's 85 grand across the board if the investment company went under after April 2019. Now let's look at this from the top down. We're going to start with a platform, sort of highest level thing. Let's say you invest with Hargreaves Lansdowne, all right, and you hold funds with Invesco, Fidelity, and Vanguard. Um, Hargreaves Lansdowne is deemed to be a provider for compensation scheme purposes. So if you hold more than £85,000 there, you might think that you would be vulnerable, but you're not because your platform doesn't have access to the money held with those three funds we talked about. Um, they are essentially organizing the admin of your money to the fund providers. They are charging you for the admin, really. Um, but your money isn't held with them. Now, any cash you've got that, you know, that isn't in, yet invested in funds, that is held with them, but it's ring-fenced so that they can't access it. That's thanks to the FCAs, the Financial Conduct Authority's client money rules. So I'm not even remotely worried about a provider going under. Now, there was... Uh, a potential challenge um, for um, investors on a particular platform whose name has just escaped me, where uh, they tried to get investors' money to, to pay back creditors of the platform. Um, I don't believe that was successful, but I'd need to. I'll put a link to the Five Minute Friday where I dealt with that. So that's platform. Turning now to the funds themselves, the client money rules apply there too. So. As funds hold underlying stocks, it's important to know who actually owns the stocks, right? All OICs and unit trusts, the main kind of funds that we're talking about, they use a depository or a trustee, and the trustee holds the title. They own the underlying stocks in trust for you, right? So that means if the fund manager goes bust, they are still not holding the underlying assets, right? It's the trustees that are holding them in trust for you. So that's a legal position. They are yours, just held under trust to make the admin easy. Of course, none of this rules out fraud, right? So reputable firms abide by the client money rules. They do their best to mitigate the risk. But there's always going to be people looking to rip people off by illegal means. I don't lose a moment's sleep about the security of my clients' assets on platforms. And you, you know, we're talking some big numbers in some cases. It wouldn't be possible for some of my clients with multiple seven figures to keep less than £85,000 on any one platform. It would be an administrative nightmare and their costs would be insane. And so we don't have any compunction with having four million quid on one platform, all right? Because of these protections. Obviously, we've done due diligence on the platforms and on the fund providers and all that sort of stuff. And they are above board and there's none of this fraudulent stuff going on. Stick with reputable, well-established firms. You're not going to go too far wrong, okay? But I, I hope that clears it up. It is complex. Platform is a provider, so, but they are just, they're not holding your assets. The funds you're invested in, they are holding your assets through a trustee or a nominee. And so your, those assets are in trust for you. And again, ring fenced from the money uh, owned by the fund house, if you like, used to pay their staff and heat their offices and stuff. This is one of the benefits we have, benefits of being in a developed market. We have a very comprehensive compensation scheme, which should serve us pretty well. Right, that was seven questions, folks. And that is it. We are done with season 14. So thank you for all your feedback throughout. Um, I know I didn't get to all the questions today. That it, there is no way I could have done. Join the Facebook group. If you've got any questions, you answers, you know, I'm, I'm in there answering occasionally, you know, as I can. But there's some brilliant, far more intelligent people than me in the Facebook group. And it's a really lovely community. There's no snarkiness, no unpleasantness. It's a really great place to be. So definitely um, check that out. Meaningfulmoney.tv slash community. I also do Facebook live Q&As in there every month, right? So you can leave your questions and I do my best to answer them live, which is, uh, which is fun, as you can imagine. So more to come on what's next over the next few weeks in just a second. So here's a review that we've had. This is from Ben Affia, and this was actually left in January. I'm <laughs> somewhat ahead. <laughs> um, it, is that my head or behind in, in looking at these reviews, which is great. I've got more basically than I can read out. So I'm going to start name checking people perhaps without actually reading out their reviews. But this is from Ben Affia, um, whose headline is, if you want to improve your financial future, listen to this. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate it. Uh, excellent content, clearly explained. 
both financial, so both financial novices and those further down their financial journeys will get value from it. Well done, Pete, and thanks for your generosity. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate the review. Really helps. If you want to do that and you're liking what you're hearing here, please do leave me a review wherever you listen to podcasts, whether that's on Spotify or Podbean or whatever, meaningfulmoney.tv slash iTunes if you're of an Apple persuasion, just like Ben did. Uh, I really appreciate it because it keeps me near the top of the rankings. Now, just a quick point. If you've had some weird behavior going on on my podcast feed, that's because uh, last week, the week before this goes out, um, we launched the new Meaningful Money website. In the process of doing that, I moved the feed provider for the podcast to Libsyn. And there's always hassles, right? Because if you've got your phone to download any new episode of a podcast, if I change the feed, it will deem every episode to be new. And so some of you may have had significant numbers of downloads clogging up your phone, for which I'm very sorry. Um, check your settings, though. Don't ever have it setting set to download more than five episodes. Um, and yeah, just some issues with redirects and things like that. All technical nerdy stuff that I won't bore you with. But you should now be able to search the Meaningful Money podcast wherever your podcast provider is, right? If you've got any issues, email me, right? Do it via the spanking new website. There's a contact page on there. Very pleased with the website. It's super fast, which is much better than the old one. So what's coming up over the next few weeks? Well, actually, next week, I'm going to take, get ready for this, I'm going to take a week off. It's been a long time since I've missed a Wednesday show. Um, and I'm doing it because I'm going to be in sunny Menorca, getting some much needed R&R. &R. It's been a frantic few weeks getting the Academy launched, the new website built and ready and launched. So, uh, yeah, it's been a busy time and I'm looking forward to a break, to say the least. So I've got a slew of some great in-between episodes for you, though. All kinds of people. We've got some leading lights in the FI, Financial Independence Retire Early, FIRE community, both here and in the US. Be showcasing some financial capability initiatives. Going to be chatting with some mates. It's going to be varied, It'll be challenging. It's going to be emotional. Looking forward to it, though. And season 15 will begin after the summer. Okay, five minute Friday, we'll be back when I come back as well. It's just <laughs> not been possible. This is quite a lot of work, as I'm sure you've gathered. Not been possible to do a five minute Friday video and all the sort of checking and tweaking of websites and stuff, creating content for the Academy. Oh, it's been busy. <laughs> Most looking forward to sitting by the pool for a week. So that's what's coming up. Loads of great in between episodes, season 15 at the end of the summer. And folks, that's it for season 14. So I'm so grateful for you for all the amazing feedback that you've given me throughout this season um any comments on the questions that have been asked and the answers i've given today you can always leave them at the show notes meaningfulmoney.tv slash na10 thank you so much for your ongoing support really appreciate it check out the new website if you haven't already but thank you so much i'll talk to you next week when i've got a brill in between yourself oh two weeks time oh, man i need that holiday cheers